Our first story today is another cryptic tweet from Sam Altman. Now, last time he made a cryptic tweet, it was about two months out from the strawberry release. This video is brought to you by Vulture, the easiest way to power your generative AI startup with the latest NVIDIA chips. Check out Vulture, I'll drop a link in the description below. This time he says, I love being home in the Midwest. The night sky is so beautiful, excited for the winter constellations to rise soon. They are so great. So from this, there's already so much information to decrypt. So first, I love is his starting point. Now, if we look back to his previous strawberry tweet, I love all lowercase letters as well. So following a very similar pattern as the last time that he gave hints for a new model or kind of a new tech coming from OpenAI. Now, I love being home in the Midwest. The night sky is so beautiful. Excited for the so winter constellations, so constellation is likely in reference to the new Orion model, which is rumored to be their next frontier model. And it says winter. So maybe we can expect it before the end of the year. And then he says they are so great. And somebody actually did the digging for us. Orion is indeed one of the most prominent and easily recognizable winter constellations. Orion, Orion the model, it's definitely coming soon. Next, Microsoft is revamping their Copilot product. And to be honest, it kind of needed a revamp. The most compelling feature, Recall, was indefinitely delayed for a while. And then we just got information that it might be released next month. And that was really the only feature there was. There was a dedicated Copilot key, which you could push and it would open up ChatGPT natively in Windows, but it wasn't much more than you were getting with ChatGPT through the web. So I'm really glad to see Microsoft continuing to integrate AI into every aspect of Windows. Let's talk about all the features that are coming. So this is Copilot Pages. Let me show you what it does. So this feels very similar to Perplexity. It's able to do web search. It's able to reference external web pages so you know where they're coming from. And it gives you an answer. Plus, you can create a page from it. This isn't anything that we haven't seen before, but I think what's really unique is the interface. From the AI creation, you can start collaborating with anybody else on your team, and you can continue using AI to iterate on this document. So you could see somebody's typing right there. Create a proposal outline as a table for a sales opportunity using the same structure. So yeah, it's a really deeply integrated AI work product and it's cool. I like it a lot. So here is Copilot in Excel now. So you have a spreadsheet like normal, but now you have this Copilot window on the right side. It writes Python code for you. It automatically outputs it in the Excel document. Just really, really cool. So you simply, just like always, type in natural language, exactly what you want, and Copilot will create it for you in Excel. And there it goes lots of different charts. And again, you don't have to specify exactly what you want to see in the chart. You specify what you're trying to accomplish with the output. And here's the Python code that was written to create those charts. So again, super impressive. Love to see it. Next, here's Copilot in PowerPoint. So probably going to be the same thing. You type in exactly what you want to see and it will create the deck for you. Why commercial EV charging stations would be valuable for a retail company, including how it will help attract customers and increase foot traffic. It's doing all the research for you, puts together the deck. You can reconfigure it any way you want. You can add things. And look at that. Just with a simple prompt and a click of a button, you get the entire deck created for you. And next, here's Copilot in Outlook. So it's giving you what seems to be little tips of how to follow up. It's giving you a summary at the top. Again, not something super revolutionary, but cool nonetheless. But what I really want to show you is Copilot Studio Agent Builder. Let's see what the agents look like in Microsoft. So here's Copilot Studio. This is a field service agent. This feels very much like custom GPT. So not full agents like we've built with other agentic frameworks. This seems very much like a reskin of custom GPTs, which is fine. I love custom GPTs. So you can link to specific documents you need. You can give it web searchability. Here, you can actually let it see your documents internally, which is really nice. But yeah, it's basically custom GPTs. And Satya Nadella commented on it. And usually I wouldn't just cover a single comment, but it's actually extremely telling and kind of a dig towards open AI. As AI becomes more capable and agentic, models themselves become more of a commodity. 
and all value gets created by how you steer, ground, and fine tune these models with your business data and workflow, and how they compose with the UI layer of human to AI to human interaction. This is something I've talked about at length on this channel. Models are becoming a commodity. They're already a commodity, especially when Llama was released and was essentially able to match the performance of the top closed source frontier models. And Satya, I've said it before, he's playing 4D chess. He is investing in every AI company. He is not putting all his chips into OpenAI's model. He has partnered with Meta on Llama. He's done so much. I'm just super impressed with how all in he is on AI. So congrats to Microsoft on all their launches. Next, speaking of Meta and Llama, it turns out Mark Zuckerberg may not have been telling the truth about Llama not or never being trained on your Facebook data. The Verge published this article last week. Meta fed its AI on almost everything you've posted publicly since 2007. Unless you're in the EU, there's no ability to opt out of AI training settings that keep Facebook or Instagram posts public. Now, maybe what Mark Zuckerberg really meant is he's not gonna train it on private data, but if you've posted publicly, then they have trained on your data, which makes sense. Look, that is their major differentiation from OpenAI, from really any other AI company, is the fact that they have all of this unique, high quality data from their products. Meta has acknowledged that all text and and photos that adult Facebook and Instagram users have publicly published since 2007 have been fed into its artificial intelligence models. Australia's ABC News reports that Meta's global privacy director, Melinda Claybaugh, initially rejected claims about user data from 2007 being leveraged for AI training during a local government inquiry about AI adoption before relenting after additional questioning. Quote, the truth of the matter is that unless you have consciously set those posts to private since 2007, Meta has just decided that you will scrape all of the photos and all of the text from every public post on Instagram or Facebook since 2007 unless there was a conscious decision to set them private. That's the reality, isn't it? And she says correct. And it should have been clear that they were going to do this because in their privacy center, they essentially just say it. We use public posts and comments on Facebook and Instagram to train generative AI models for these features and for the open source community. We don't use posts or comments with an audience other than public for these purposes. So I definitely remember Mark Zuckerberg saying that they're not training on Facebook's data, but maybe he said private data and I just didn't notice. So if you're on Facebook, your data is getting trained on if your content is public. Next, Mistral AI has released a new model and in very Mistral form, all they did was drop a torrent link and everybody had to figure out what it was. And it turns out it is a vision model. It's called Pixtral 12B and it is a vision model. You load it up with an image and you can ask anything about that image. I've been meaning to play around with it. I haven't had a chance yet, but if you want me to do a test of it, let me know in the comments. Next, a new open source project from a former OpenAI employee looks really cool. William says, I'm excited to announce the future of prompt engineering E11. Developed from ideas during my time at OpenAI, E11 is a light functional LM programming library, automatic versioning and tracing, rich local OSS visualization tools, multimodality native. E11 is built out of frustration for frameworks like Langchain AI on three principles. Prompts are programs, not strings. Prompts are parameters of machine learning models, and every call to a language model is worth its weight in credits. Prompting should be readable and scientific. So here's an example of how it works. On the left side, what you're seeing is essentially the same thing with Langchain. And with E11, we have just a few lines of code, you specify the model, and then you define functions for the prompt that you want to use. So you define joke, you return tell me a joke about, and then you simply call the method. Prompt engineering is an optimization process, and E11 automatically versions and serializes them, no custom IDE or editor required, very cool. And they have an open source UI that you can use, so prompt engineering goes from a dark art to a science with the right tools. E11 Studio is a local open source tool for prompt version control, monitoring, and visualization. So that's what we're seeing here. And version control for prompts is incredibly important when you're building robust and really production-ready systems using large language models, especially when you're using an agentic framework. This would plug in great into that. And it's multimodal natively. So you can see right here, all the images are getting output. So if you wanna check it out, I'll drop the GitHub link in the description below. It is open source, so enjoy. Next, Adobe is coming out with their own 
text to video model and it is using the same brand name Firefly and Alexandru says welcome to the world Adobe Firefly video model announced today public beta later this year designed to be safe for commercial use and that's really the distinguishing property of Adobe's AI ventures is the fact that they're only training on what they say is IP that they either own or licensed for great cinematic quality and fluid motion camera controls and of course deep integration into our tools so here's an example of what it's going to look like you can upload an image you can have a prompt right here and it generates it so here's a few examples different prompts and the videos look pretty good not fantastic but pretty darn good and it feels very similar to the text to image product that they released earlier this year except it's text to video and here's one that i think is amazing so this one right here is real so it's a little girl with a magnifying glass looking at a flower and that's the reference video and then this down here is the generated clip this is the clip based on what you may need to fill in your extra video that you may not have captured so i think this is absolutely brilliant. It looks really good and if you forget to capture a shot or you just need something extra as you're thinking about it when you're editing, now you can do it simply with a prompt. Next, the CEO of Klarna is basically rewriting their entire tech stack themselves using AI. And I think this is extremely telling for the future of SaaS businesses. SaaS businesses have been overcharging for a lot of years. In a former life, I was a SaaS startup founder, so this is very familiar to me. Klarna's CEO said that the company is shutting down its software as a service provider, Salesforce, and within a few weeks will shut down Workday, two of the biggest SaaS companies on the planet. There are large ongoing internal initiatives that are a combination of AI standardization and simplification. As an example, we just shut down Salesforce. Within a few weeks, we will shut down Workday. We are shutting down a lot of our SaaS providers as we are able to consolidate. Now I'm a little bit torn on this. On the one hand, I totally understand. You have all of these new tools that allow you to create software so much more efficiently and at such a higher rate that maybe you don't actually need to pay for all these software as a services, which can be really expensive depending on how many employees you have. But on the other hand, engineers in general underestimate the amount of work it's gonna to take to build new systems. And I think this is gonna be an example of that. At my previous company, the hard part wasn't actually the core software that we were building. It was things like integrations into other platforms. Building those integrations, maintaining them, making sure that we had all the right ones, that takes a tremendous amount of work, and I don't know if AI is quite there yet, but it'll be interesting to see how AI affects the SaaS industry. Next, Google Labs releases Notebook LM, which is basically a way to load up notes or documents, and then it converts it into a podcast for you so you can actually listen to a discussion based on whatever you've uploaded. Our new audio overview feature can turn documents, slides, charts, and more into engaging discussions with one click. So here's an example, which is based on a blog post, Notebook LM goes global with slide support and better ways to fact check. You ever get that feeling like you're just drowning in information, articles, PDFs, websites, all promising to like unlock the secrets of the universe? Or at least help you finally finish that research project you've been putting off. Exactly. It's like trying to drink from a fire hose, you know. <laughs> it sounds really good. It's interesting. I'm trying to figure out what the actual use cases are. I could imagine loading up a research paper and listening to it, but I don't know. Is it going to be as effective as just reading it? What do you think the use cases for this are? It's definitely cool tech, but I'm just not sure what the actual applications are. Next, of course, last week, O1 was released by OpenAI. It made all the headlines. I made multiple videos about it. Be sure to check those out. And the ARC Prize tested it. As a reminder, the ARC Prize is a benchmark specific for AGI. And many of the other benchmarks in the world have really just been beaten by artificial intelligence at this point. But the ARC Prize is very unique in that if you're a human and you're looking at the test, it's very simple to figure out. But AI really struggles with it because ARC Prize's tests test specifically for the ability to acquire new knowledge and then use that new knowledge in figuring out how to solve these puzzles. And O1 did pretty well. But but it seems like just testing a model is not enough. And I'm going to talk about what that actually means. So here we can see an 8% score for Gemini 1.5, a 9% score for GPT-40, and here's a 13% score for O1 Mini. And O1 Preview and Sonnet 3.5 are tied at 21%. Now, 21% doesn't sound all that great, but just as a reference, 21% compared to GPT-40's 9% is a massive, 
massive improvement. Now, all these other companies have done much better. Mine's AI, for example, and they're using different techniques, not just the raw model, but they're using fine tuning and they're using different agentic frameworks. And so now what I'm thinking is a company like Minds AI is going to take O1, plug it into their existing framework for how they accomplish the 46% and then get a much higher score. So again, it's not enough for just the raw model right now. Next, we have another glimpse into the future of video games. Tencent presents Game Gen O, open world video game generation. Look at this video. So we have a paper and we have a GitHub page for it. So we introduced Game Gen O, the first diffusion transformer model tailored for the generation of open world video games. High quality open domain generation by simulating a wide array of game engine features such as innovative characters, dynamic environments, complex actions, and diverse events. Now, just a couple of weeks ago, I covered Doom being created exclusively by a diffusion model. And now we have this. So if you don't think video games are gonna be vastly different in just a few years, you are going to be very surprised. Let's look at a few examples of the actual generations themselves. Here are character generations, Geralt of Rivia. Here's one that looks very similar to Red Dead Redemption. Here's one that's a security guard, kind of looks like Snake from Metal Gear Solid. They also have environment generation. So here's beautiful cherry blossoms. Here are some palm trees. Here's a pyramid. And it could also generate action scenes. So here's one driving. Here's one flying, sailing. Here's a motorcycle. Looks really, really good. And here are characters walking through what looks to be any modern video game. So here's a cyberpunk version and something that kind of looks like Destiny. So another really cool project showing what the future of video games are going to be like. And for the last story of today, the godmother of AI launches a new company. Fei-Fei Li has launched World Labs with $230 million of funding at a billion dollar valuation. The company's focus will be on developing artificial intelligence with 3D perception. World Labs describes its primary product as large world models. In a blog post announcing the company's launch, it pointed out that current generative AI models can only interact with the world through text, audio, and video. This is something that Jan LeCun has talked extensively extensively about and why he doesn't think large language models are enough to actually model the world. But that is what they're hoping to do here, spatial artificial intelligence. To advance beyond the capabilities of today's models, we need spatially intelligent AI that can model the world and reason about objects, places, and interactions in 3D space and time. Now. The other company that is doing this, or at least has the data to go do this, is Tesla. They have a ton of real world video data that can be used to train world models. So I'm really curious what they're gonna come out with soon. So that's it for today. If you enjoyed this video, please consider giving a like and subscribe, and I'll see you in the next one.